uh, so quickly from lunch. From all the conversations today already, you'd have realized that there's some overarching themes in the cover bond market. Topics such as the directive, such as the European secured note, might seem like quite European focused parochial concerns. I'm hoping in this panel we're going to prove a little bit that it's not so much that it does have an important influence on the globalization of this market, whether the standards that have been defined in Europe perhaps provide a template, whether we offer the, the carrot of prudential treatment for Canadian covered bonds and Singaporean covered bonds and future covered bonds, and hopefully we guide the discussion in, in Basel, or, or Basel um, for the development of the product. To help me do that, we have the panel you see in front of you. Can I ask you gentlemen to introduce yourselves first and say a little bit about your organization and what you do? Sammy? Sammy Godfrey, as uh, I am Head of Treasury and Financial Market of SFIL. SFIL is a mother company of CAFIL, the cover bond vehicle, our cover bond vehicle, specialized in the public sector. Uh, CAFIL is a quite big cover bond issuer with uh, more than uh, 50 billion uh, outstanding, and is specialized in the public sector with two different uh, uh, business lines. The first one is the uh, financing of uh, local authorities and uh, public hospitals in France, obviously we are French, and the second uh, business line is the refinancing of the uh, large export contracts with a guarantee of the state, and we are also by far the largest player. So just to summarize, I would say what is SFIL and its carbon bond uh, vehicle CAFIL. Yeah, hello, Frank Nierese, Swiss Life Asset Managers, based in Munich. Um, Swiss Life, obviously, is a Swiss company based in Zurich, a pure life insurance company. I work on the asset management side for the German unit of it meaning that I buy and sell uh, all kinds of fixed income products. And on top of that, we have an overlay structure, meaning that we have a system of centers of competences for various single asset classes, one of them being covered bonds, and it has me, it is me who has the pleasure to head that one. Hello, I'm Art Visser. I work uh, as head of the financial markets and collateral section in the market operations area of the ECB. So as the name already says, uh, collateral is in it. So uh, my division uh, that I work in is especially looking uh, at covered bonds from the perspective uh, as covered bonds being one of the assets that we accept as collateral in a collateral framework. I used to work in the past in a sister division, and I still know quite well this sister division where the people work that do actually all the purchase for the purchase program. So I'm not working in that area myself, but uh, it's close by colleagues. And perhaps it's also good to tell what I'm not. I'm not a supervisory person. I'm also not uh, somebody who's in all the regulatory uh, debates. I'm really from the collateral and the market operations side. Well, do you forget to mention that you are the biggest investor in covered bonds in the world, by far? <laughs> <laughs> Not me personally, but okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, clearly, the covered bonds have a very special place in the collateral framework. Um, I think, yeah, you can download the guide and read all the nice things that you do for covered bonds in terms of its treatment. I'd rather understand, though, if I can, why it is that it gets this special treatment. So, covered bond. I'm not sure actually what you mean with special treatment in the collateral framework. Mm -hmm. It's one of the asset classes that we accept in our collateral framework. And uh, as I also said yesterday, when I mentioned some uh, numbers, uh, covered bonds are a very uh, large asset class within the, um, uh, the collateral that is being mobilized with uh, the, uh, the euro system. I wrote it down because I mix it up myself from time to time. So it's 20% of the mobilized assets uh, at the moment are covered bonds, uh, and the covered bonds that are being mobilized with the euro system, they are 25% of what is eligible, and uh, the, that amount is 350 billion. Um, to be uh, uh, possibly eligible as covered bond and uh, as collateral, you need to fulfill certain criteria. You already referred to uh, the rules that we publish in our uh, general documentation. Just a few, uh, name a few uh, main ones is that your uh, covered bond has to, or your asset has to be issued in the euro area, so in, uh, in Europe. 
uh, it needs to be traded on an uh, accepted um, uh, market in Europe. Uh, the issuer should be from the EU, the EEA, or an, uh, the G10. And um, then the special treatment uh, that we give to covered bonds in our framework is that uh, you can own use your covered bond as a, uh, as a counterparty. You can uh, own use your uh, covered bonds uh, provided they are CRR compliant. Okay. You can use your own covered bonds as collateral. That's a fairly key point to the usefulness of it. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, I shouldn't talk about special treatment. I should talk about perfectly justified treatment <laughs> for that framework. Uh, yeah, because the treatment in general is not different than other collateral mm -hmm. types, uh, yeah. except you, for this own use. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But when you define your rules, to what extent does that look at the, or uh, does it at all look at the European Commission rules, the, the, the CRR compliance, all of the br stuff coming out of Brussels, or do you just look at it as a security with its own characteristics? Well, it's a bit both. So in our rules, uh, general documentation, we refer to some, uh, let's say, external uh, uh, rules or uh, procedures. So for instance, like CRR compliance and usage compliance that is uh, in our um, framework uh, is referred to. But to a large extent, uh, the framework and the rules are based on uh, the needs that we see from a collateral perspective. So, so we don't, uh, generally, we don't want to be too dependent on, uh, on let's say, outside uh, frameworks. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I think that's a very useful uh, backdrop for, for the rest of the discussion about the, the regulatory treatment. Um, Frank, can I start by asking, as you work for a Swiss company in Basel in Switzerland, <laughs> can I ask you to just summarize what it is that the, the Basel, Basel or Baal, what should I say? Yeah, Basel is fine, Basel, okay. and it's Swiss what, what, what they, what they mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. Although there are probably uh, people in the room that are much more expert in this issue uh, than I am, looking at rating agencies are uh, dedicated covered bond analysts. But I still uh, try to give you a, a very broad idea of the of what uh, Basel um, decided upon uh, back in uh, December 2017. Uh, when they uh, revamped the uh, overall uh, regulatory framework, they decided uh, that, that they want to recognize covered bonds as a specific asset class that deserves preferential treatment, meaning 10% uh, risk weight asset uh, treatment for covered bonds that are rated AA minus or better. And on top of that, of course, um, they um, stipulate a couple of aspects what a covered bond uh, should look like to deserve that treatment. And that is very principle-based, perhaps even more principle-based as uh, the EU directive we were talking about yesterday, because the scope, um, obviously, is even broader, it's globally. But they've uh, pinned it down to the uh, obvious aspects, like um, it is a legal-based product, uh, dual recourse needs to have some supervision on it, needs a big bankruptcy remote, and there's one specific aspect, maybe we'll touch upon that later on, that is, needs to be over-collateralized by 10%, that's what they stipulate, and there needs to be a lot of uh, transparency around that. And last but not least, they say it must uh, be high-quality assets backing these covered bonds. They uh, uh, explicitly mention um, residential mortgage loans, and uh, public mortgage loans. Um, but they did not stipulate exactly uh, what, L, what other high quality assets may, uh, may be referred to or not. This is the, the very general uh, framework. And if all goes well, uh, that is coming uh, into effect in 2022 with a phasing in period up to 2027. Okay, thank you. So most of those rules are quite compatible with most of the new directive definitions, with one glaring exception, the point about 10%. Sabri, what do you think about, what's your view on that 10% from Baal versus 5% from the new yeah. directive? Yeah. You know, I, 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 my personal opinion is that the 5% was too low. Uh, too low. Uh, clearly, clearly. Uh, I, uh, I think that 10% uh, seems fine, it's a constraint for some countries, from some issues. Uh, but uh, the, uh, if you are managing a covered bond vehicle, 
I think the OCE, the overcapitalization, is something that is uh, important to strengthen the structure, the financial structure of the vehicle. 10% uh, is really a minimum. I think uh, if you want to target something quite conservative and uh, bond friendly, or even, uh, you have probably to target uh, uh, something around 13% uh, and more. It depends on the asset, the quality, but if you have top quality asset, uh, in our case, we have only exposure on the uh, public sector in France and uh, uh, with uh, some exposure also directly on the state. Uh, the 11-12% uh, the is fine, but I think that we, and uh, my concern is regarding the, uh, the other assets and the uh, public sector exposures. Uh, it's more, for example, on the mortgage, I'm always a bit surprised that uh, uh, you have a double, I would say, dimension in the exposure uh, to the real estate market from covered bond vehicles. Uh, the first one is uh, the price and the evolution of the prices with potential bubbles. And the other one is the LTV, uh, which are quite different from a country to another one. As, as an investor, if I had been investor for a long time, I think that it's something that I, I, I would, should probably uh, need to monitor more carefully than what is done. Uh, I'm always surprised that uh, uh, you have uh, some vehicles with uh, high LTV uh, in a market uh, with uh, roughly 50%, 50% increase of the pricing during the last five or uh, 10 years, which is incredible because at the end of the day, uh, if, you, uh, if you want really uh, to, uh, to have soft, some cushion on uh, your, uh, your assets, you need uh, or to have a lower uh, loan to value or to invest in markets in which the pricing prices have been, I would say, up, but for not for uh, by 50%. It's very important that it's why the 10%, I'm not in favor of the 10%, I think that it's more conservative. I know that in Europe, uh, a lot of our peers uh, do prefer the 5% because it's European. Uh, I'm not sure that uh, because it's European, it's better. Okay. There are obviously different risk characteristics and de facto over collateralization, our friends in the rating agencies will tell you what you really need for any given program, but it's about a minimum standard. And it's, it's interesting, a lot of people have said 5% is too high, and you're saying something completely opposite. Mm -hmm. To our investors, mm -hmm. your view um, on that? Yeah, well, uh, I agree with, uh, uh, with what Sammy it's said in terms of, uh, <laughs> yeah, and, well, partly, yeah. <laughs> uh, in, in the sense that uh, if you have a volatile uh, cover asset, then you need uh, higher over collateralization. However, not all cover assets are that volatile. And uh, <coughs> for me, it's more important uh, to have high quality cover assets, a good ALM uh, matching position. And if these two uh, things come together, um, I can uh, perfectly live with a, a small over collateralization as uh, there's a, that is in Germany the case, like 2% minimum. Um, and in that case, I do not need 10% over collateralization. I'm fine with three or six, as long as uh, the other uh, requirements are met. I'd just like to point out here that the investor here is asking for less over collateralization and the issuer for more. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's true. But, well, um, yeah, of course, I, I like uh, more over collateralization, but uh, we're here in the, um, in the panel that uh, has a global uh, view and we want uh, to, give, uh, to give this, um, this product a boost globally. And yeah, um, then I would say I don't need to, to put up hurdles that I do not necessarily need. Okay, Ad, do you, you want that? No, I have not much to add to uh, what the colleagues already said. Uh, um, no, uh, we have, uh, of course, risk managers in our <laughs> bank, like uh, also in yours, I'm sure. Uh, that look at these things, and uh, if they would not be happy, they would. Uh, well, we will talk about CPTs, I think, uh, in a minute. Uh, if needed, we will adjust our risk control framework to then take care of any perceived risk. Okay, and then you wouldn't hard code that into your eligibility criteria ever for, for the collateral frameworks. If we would hard code in our a, a specific number, a five percent or a ten percent or. I think that is not very likely to happen anytime soon. Yeah. Okay. 
Okay. Let, let's talk about that point of maturity, seeing as you mentioned it, Frank. Um, one of the aspects of the directive is this idea of an extendable maturity, whether it's a soft bullet or a conditional pass-through structure, needs to have an issuer discretion, needs to not have issuer discretion as, as its criteria. Does that concern you? Are you comfortable with? Yes, uh, um, to uh, put everything and uh, uh, everyone um, on, this, uh, on the same level, now we are switching a bit to the EU, EU directive. Before Sorry, the EU directive. We were, talk, uh, yes. we were talking about the global Basel perspective, now the EU is spe spe specific one. But as you can see already, these two things uh, are linked a bit to each other, and yeah, maybe the EU directive will pave the way a bit to the Basel one. And in the EU directive, um, there, is, um, uh, some, there are some statements about maturity extension um, of uh, covered bonds, um, so that uh, uh, under certain uh, conditions, the hard, uh, the, the hard maturity can switch into something like an extended maturity, perhaps even into pass-through um, conditioned, um, conditioned pass-through uh, structure. And in the EU uh, directive uh, proposal, um, there are mentioned a couple of uh, things I cannot quote uh, by heart now, but um, at least it is not exactly mentioned. It's only in the event of default of the issuer that this trigger will uh, kick in. And this is something that is uh, really annoying uh, us and uh, concerning us, um, because as an insurance company, okay, we do not uh, do an ALM mid matching on a specific date but uh, perhaps not uh, on a specific month. But it makes a difference whether we get our money back in, uh, uh, in one week or in 25 years' time. And we do not like to have that uh, up to the discretion of the issuer. That must be um, uh, a medium of last resort, and that should be to the regulator or to the effect that uh, the issuer defaults, but not to the discretion, dis uh, discretion of the issuer. So that matching requirement, does that mean you are averse to soft bullets currently? Well, soft bullet, uh, as I understand it, this is something that has an um, extension of one or two years. Um, if um, yeah, the issue went into default and that is more or less a technical thing uh, to, uh, to do the switching from the uh, going concern of the uh, issuer into something where only the cover pool uh, is the source to provide liquidity. Uh, I'm not a banker, but I would ex assume that this is a, a big thing that obviously no one has experience with. Um, to avoid some technical defaults, I'm fine with that. But only for this reason. Mm -hmm. Sammy, what, what's your view on that? <laughs> I, I will try again to, to wake up you this afternoon after lunch. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I, I'm totally against the soft bullet. Totally. Totally against. I, I think it's, uh, it's, uh, it could be even a really a, a mistake for the market, for the government market, this move to the soft bullet. Uh, just because uh, my concern is very simple. It's not pricing, just Frank. Do you price the possibility of the extension? Are you paid for it? No, not at all. Okay. Uh, I have seen many times in the market when something is not priced, an option is not priced, at one point it has to be priced. But you never get the money. It's always the same. You can take all the examples through the different cycles. You will find the same answer. That's why I'm against. And as a covered bond insurer, we, we have a hard bullet format. And if the regulator, if the regulation change and we need to move to a sort of uh, extension in case of default, we will do that because it will be regulatory. But yeah. we do not intend to do that. And we think the hard bullet is something that has to be priced. I'm sorry that the market is not doing that. But you know, the covered bond market nowadays is not pricing a lot of things. There is no differentiation. It's one That's of true. the few things which is not priced. I'm looking guilty about that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh, no, they are not guilty. No, no one is guilty. <laughs> so the. You mentioned there about option and, and, and an optionality that's not priced. But the, certainly the EBA proposal said that it can only be triggered in an issuer default. The Commission Directive has slightly backtracked from that and said that it can't yeah. be at issue of discretion. So that doesn't sound like an option to me. That sounds like a regulator stepping in and telling you, you must extend. 
surely that I, I do prefer the, the, the default you prefer. than the regulatory intervention. Mm -hmm. Because in the, mm -hmm. in the case of the regulatory intervention, if the comparison is with the subordinate debt, uh, they could do that in case, for example, there is a breach of solvency, liquidity, or I don't know any regulation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I do prefer the default because it's a it's, it's clear. defined definition, it's very simple. But uh, at the end, I do prefer the hard bullet. Mm. <laughs> and I suppose there's always the risk of, it isn't an issue of discretion because the regulator told me, so I phone up the regulator and says, please force me to yeah. extend because I'm in a liquidity oh. crunch at the moment. Okay. Ad, you're a, you're a notorious hater of conditional pass-throughs. <laughs> yeah. Does this, um, with all the comments that you've made, do you want to comment, on, first of all, on how conditional pass-throughs are treated differently within the collateral framework? And then secondly, to what extent does this, this trigger and, and making it not at issue of discretion, does that help your concerns? Yeah, so in the collateral framework, uh, we actually uh, accept uh, conditional pass-throughs. The only new thing that was introduced, what I also explained to people yesterday, is that we have increased the, the haircuts uh, on applied to uh, extendable maturities in case of own use, so only in case of own use, which I think makes perfect sense because own use, it, it means uh, uh, exactly uh, when there is an issue with the counterparty and then we end up with uh, the bonds that are being issued by that same counterparty and they all of a sudden start to extend or things start to happen. So in the case you need the collateral, it's exactly at the point when also the counterparty who is the issuer has, has issues. So I, th I think it makes a lot of sense to have uh, some extra risk control measures for um, the own use of extendable bonds. But like I said before, they are accepted. So uh, I'm not sure if I agree that we are the big haters of conditional pass-throughs. Mm -hmm. Then I'm saying it to be provocative. <laughs> and then your question was? Well, whether this trigger in the directive, the proposed trigger that it cannot be at issue at, um, uh, at the issuer's choice, does that help you to, to mitigate? Does it make it a safer thing for you? Um, well, as I also said yesterday, uh, we are still internally looking, so including also all the supervisory and risk people and other um, uh, areas in the bank uh, to the whole directive, and we will publish an opinion on it in June. So I cannot say too much about it yet. But I know from uh, the discussions that are ongoing that uh, also this point is definitely one where in the opinion we will probably say, uh, talk about and I think we will also go more in your direction if I hear the internal talk, but it's still ongoing. But uh, I think the uh, EBA text uh, uh, sounded a bit more appealing than uh, what is now on the table. So we might, in the opinion, uh, go a bit in that direction. Thank but you. like I said, uh, it's still to be published, so, and there's a lot of talk still ongoing. Uh, may I perhaps uh, just add yeah. something? I'm, uh, to I totally agree with uh, your uh, disliking these uh, sort of things. Don't know uh, whether everybody in the room is uh, familiar with the conditional pass-through aspect. It uh, means that if um, there happens something, be it a default or now with a directive, some other uh, trigger, um, then the hard bullet will be replaced by the statement saying, whenever uh, the cover assets pay some th uh, something, you, the investor, will receive that. And uh, if you put it in this way, it, uh, it sounds already more strange than this nice word conditional pass-through. And I heard from one analyst an example that uh, made it perfectly clear to me. He said, it is as if you are at a bus stop and the sign says, uh, the bus comes when it arrives. It will <laughs> never be late. It will always meet the criteria. But it doesn't help me anything because I, I may need to wait for another two or three hours to make, uh, that the bus arrives. And uh, for the issuer, that means he has not really an, an incentive um, to do everything he can to make sure he meets this hard bullet uh, maturity. And that's what is annoying me. He, he just simply says, well, I'll do what I can, that, uh, but perhaps not really that to make this hard bullet, and if not, well, it's you, the, uh, the, uh, the investor's problem. I don't like that. I'm actually just looking to see if there are any issuers of conditional pass-throughs in the room who are prepared to make any comments uh -oh. at this stage. No? Nick is not here. <laughs> Someone go and get Nick. <laughs> <laughs> um, another aspect of the um, directive, which is potentially controversial, is regarding the asset definition. 
and there's mm -hmm. this um, this clause, Art Article 6, within, the, within saying that the assets are the following assets, unless they're not, and then laying down the right for a national discretion. At the same time, there's a debate about European secured notes and the idea of other assets. Now, if you look outside the existing covered bond countries, this is potentially can be very, very useful in countries that don't have such developed mortgage markets, that have, for example, infrastructure assets needs, SMEs in Turkey, you've seen. Um, what do we think about the, the fact that the Commission has decided to go down this route of allowing the national discretion on assets? Uh, yeah, I do understand that it could be, uh, uh, I would say, something that uh, is seen as a weakness because uh, it introduces uh, uh, potentially assets which are not the usual assets that you find in a cover pool. Uh, but I think as, as a cover bond, as a European covered bond uh, issuer, uh, we need to be flexible. We need to understand that in many countries, uh, uh, the kind of assets that we put in our cover pool, they don't really need the cover pool format to refinance such assets. They need probably other assets, as, a, as you have just mentioned, Richard. I think it's very important to be flexible because the product, as the conference always is around the, this great product, which is covered bonds, but if we are too much strict on the assets, and we don't have to do that because uh, as European, uh, the product, I would say, start in Europe, but now is no more only European product. It's something that has to be managed by each region, each country. But if the, the investors are ready to analyze a cover bond with uh, loans to SMEs or infrastructure, in the same way that they are analyzing covered bond in, uh, with uh, mortgages or with public sector exposure, it's fine. It's, it's not my job. It's uh, uh, the, uh, the selection uh, that any investor has to do is that uh, uh, the, the issue. It's why I, I, I think it's good that the product has to expand and uh, just it uh, it's, uh, it's will be uh, it's the job of the investors really to be selective and to define uh, into brackets what is a covered bond for them. Mm -hmm. mm. Um, I see it a bit differently. Um, what you're talking about is, of, of course, it's true, but that is more the second step, in my opinion, to take the covered bond uh, um, aspect uh, further. And in order to do this, uh, in Europe we are currently uh, introducing this uh, ESN, this European uh, Secured Notes, and in my opinion that's a perfect um, tool to do this. Here, um, regarding covered bonds, we are just um, um, uh, at the doorstep of taking uh, this product uh, from a European product to a global product. And uh, in order to do this, we need to be as clear-cut and as simple as possible so that everyone in the world understands this is a covered a bond covered by this and that. And not that, but this and that. And this is mortgage, and that is government-related um, yeah, cover assets. And nothing else, in my opinion. Because this is something that everyone in the world knows. Everyone in the world has land and a government. And that is something uh, that we can all agree probably on, uh, on a global scale, and that should be the first step uh, to make it as simple as possible to give that product a global boost, and if that had established, has established globally, then we can take about the second step, but not yet. Mm. Well, I'm in a country that doesn't have a lot of mortgages, and Loic's uh, presentation yesterday showed quite a lot of countries have almost no mortgages relative to GDP but other assets, and I come to you with something which is structured like a covered bond, yeah. how do you think about that? that? Then we call that global secured note instead of European secured note, but okay. not covered bond, please. Mm -hmm. right. uh, Lucas? <laughs> <laughs> but it wouldn't fit into the same analytical framework, for example. You'd think of it as yeah. a different, different pricing paradigm, different relative value approach, all the yeah, as I said, we talk about uh, preferred risk-weighted assets uh, on a global scale that are not that large assets uh, out there that uh, can have a hope of having that, and we should not overload that. Okay, fair enough. Do you have any well, other assets? 
I have not so much to add to it. I think uh, it would be good if the um, directive here would be a bit more clear than it is now. If the high liquid assets now is uh, not so precisely defined. Clear in terms of the criteria for a member state carve-outs or clear in terms of actually saying this asset and that's the whole list? Yes, more the latter, I think, yes. But again, this is also one of the things that we're still looking at. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, on that topic, the yeah. Comet Bank SME transaction, which is a famous transaction, it's the only um, contract law covered mm -hmm. bond that's used SME as collateral. That was treated in your collateral framework as a, a category three, the same as a regular covered bond. Can yes. you explain what the, the thinking behind that was? Well, it was a structured covered bond. So it fulfilled the criteria of a structured covered bond. So it was uh, treated as a structured covered bond, which has the same haircut category as normal covered bonds. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it was, it was another category, but it gets the same treatment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, even though the assets weren't the traditional, that was irrelevant to your categorization? No, it was relevant. They were categorized to the structured covered bonds. Mm. And they fall also on a haircut category three, just like the normal covered bonds. Let me ask you a much more general question. We, we've talked through a lot of the specifics. I'm almost nervous to say this. I don't know if Didier is in the room, but is there a sense, Frank, that the directive is a degree of dumbing down of the concept of covered bonds, of dumbing down of reducing the, the quality of the covered bond? Did you read? Well, it, uh, it sets a minimum standard. That's a good thing um, for, on a European uh, base and even more important on the global base. And so far, that's a good step in the, to the right direction. Um, yeah, I, uh, I'm just a bit worried. And there may be um, yeah, some, uh, some regulators or some uh, lawmakers may be tempted to uh, not only increase their rules in order to comply uh, with, the, the, with the new regulations, but perhaps uh, sometimes decrease their standards. Because um, let's say, uh, yeah, put, take a simple example, if uh, there were uh, a country out there where you have 25% uh, of collateralization, Spain or something like that, um, they could say, oh, only 10% are necessary, we lower that. <coughs> well, no one uh, bars them from doing so yet. And uh, if, I, uh, if I could, uh, yeah, announce a wish, I would say, please, uh, in the uh, phase of implementing uh, the EU directive, um, implement some backstop that that could not happen. That would relax me when I'm uh, looking at the implementation of the EU directive. But it is supposed to be a minimum standard. It isn't the ultimate safeguard, the investor. Shouldn't it be a market standard that defines the actual level of quality? Yeah, this is a differentiation uh, um, between different legal frameworks or with, with between different um, issuers. Um, but still, uh, I wouldn't find it a pity if uh, in some countries uh, we reached a certain standard and we go back from that one. I would like to see this an, to be an improvement overall. And uh, yeah, to be uh, clear here, I'd, uh, I see most regulators uh, going this direction improve their regulation in, um, in terms of aspects where do they do not yet fulfill the criterias, a criteria, but they do not uh, go back. Uh, but this is just what I heard so far, yeah. and it's uh, just a hope that this will remain like this, but the risk is out there that it will not. Okay. Sammy, you have a very strong covered bond law. Perhaps it's too strong. This directive says that you can relax some standards. If we can relax some standards, uh, at the end of the day, it's, uh, each issuer has to decide uh, what is good for him. Uh, as a cover bond, a vehicle of an agency, of a state-owned uh, bank, we do not think that we need to relax our financial discipline. We think that we need to be, uh, to stay as conservative as we have been since 2013 and the creation of uh, uh, CAFIL and uh, SFIL. Uh, uh, just one thing which, uh, just on the, uh, I'll say the European view and the global view. I'm always a bit surprised 
uh, that uh, uh, I would say that uh, the, the product, the carbon bond product, is still uh, uh, really still you as a European product. Or still, the idea is that we need to duplicate the uh, the German or the French. The French is a is a weaker version of the German, obviously. Uh, <laughs> But <laughs> I, 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 I say don't that. think so. <laughs> I don't think so. No, no, it's, it's, a, it was, it's a joke. Huh? It's a joke. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing personal. <laughs> it's a joke. Uh, but the VDP are nodding. <laughs> yeah. I, 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 I think that if you want to convince new countries to, uh, to, uh, to implement the current bond, uh, we need to be flexible and really to be flexible. We need also to keep our own rules and uh, the European Directive is fine. I have nothing to comment or to criticize on the European Directive. It's more when you think what is next for the covered bond. If next is Asia, is uh, North America, is Latin America, is I don't know which country you can choose. Uh, you need to say at the end of the day what is a covered bond is something with a cover pool, with high quality assets, with a cushion, with OC, and so on and so on. Uh, and uh, and that's, that's it. I think that if you want to do only like the German and the French, or the German, obviously, which is public sector and mortgages, okay, uh, but I'm not sure that it's the future of the product. Uh, it's not at all the future of product. Uh, and just uh, to, to, to <coughs> comment one thing on the, uh, the, the, the pricing. Uh, if you have a look to the pricing of the covered bond on the open market, it's not only the ECB uh, which is uh, uh, pushing tighter the pricing and the spreads. It's not. Uh, I, I have read many comments on ECB, ECB, the fault of ECB, it's because of the ECB. Uh, okay, they have been supporting the market. If there is no differentiation on the covered bond market in euro is because the investor are no more able to have a decent pricing or a pricing which has something to do with the underlying risk quality of each covered bond. Is that the issue? It's not the ECB. We have seen that last Tuesday before uh, uh, leaving Paris to, 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 to join the conference. Just we have priced a transaction and uh, uh, a 10 year for one and a half billion. And uh, the, the banks, the market, was surprised that uh, uh, we change our pricing strategy. Surprise, big surprise, always, because you know the syndicates in the banks, uh, it's always uh, uh, the consensus. As they don't have any personal idea on the market, it's consensus. Huh? It's uh, the best way uh, to deliver uh, when you have no idea. Just uh, <laughs> we we've discussed and uh, asking the usual question, uh, the involvement of ECB, uh, the investor base uh, at such tight levels, uh, what could be really the feedback on the key investors, the big ones that we have not seen in our order books uh, since uh, two years, three years, because it was too tight and so on. But at the end of the day, I was not convinced by the feedback of the syndicates, of the different bank syndicates. And I said, okay, I think that I could be the first issuer with uh, uh, an order from ECB much lower than what we have seen. And I heard from the banks under the control of many banks which are in that room that Recently, it was the order of ECB was around 40% of the size. Okay, I say, okay, my job is to say, I have a quite uncertain demand from investors. I have a potential uh, decrease of the size of the order from ECB. What I need is to assess what kind of price concession could bring some investors on board. And I explained to the banks that I think that between 11 and 12, it would be fine. Just because the uh, most recent transaction, I think they start around 10 bips. Just if you give one bit more, because you never know the secondary level, where are the secondary level, 
you give one beep more or two beeps more, it will be fine. And it has worked. And ECB has reduced its order. I cannot tell you, but it's lower than 40%, but oh, the banks probably will update you, uh, giving you this that, uh, uh, confidential information, which is perhaps no more confidential <laughs> today, but we will see. The pricing is very important, because at the end of the day, what the European market is not giving a good uh, image of the covered bond. What I've seen in other countries that uh, clearly the pricing has a rationale which is stronger than in the European market. But we are now entering a new era. I think that in the coming months, you will see more transactions with pricing quite different. For example, uh, an unfrequent issuer uh, very, uh, with a very uh, a strong uh, credit story uh, should price at tighter level than, I would say, uh, another one, which is uh, obviously uh, not as strong as... Uh, as, uh, as it, uh, it's very important that differentiation also uh, is, has to demonstrate to the other countries that the covered bond is not, you know, a market with only one price. I'd like to ask you a follow-on question about that, about I know how important non-European investors are and the extent that you know, their views on this directive or possible better treatment for your bonds in their prudential framework and, and changing the ECB role, how that influences your, your exports. Before I do that, though, I'm going to just say there's a, a polling question on the app. Um, we're asking on that app about, on, on that question about what is the biggest driver of going to be the biggest driver of global growth over the next few years, whether it's, okay, we see them there, whether it is the, um, the, the regulatory drivers or economic or there isn't going to be any growth. So please have a bit of a think about that. But also, Simon, let me just ask you, so how much do you sell all your bonds currently or excluding the ECB participation to, to non-European investors who don't get the regulatory treatment? On average, recently, 15%. Excluding ECB, it's uh, between 25 and 30 percent, the ECB, the order from ECB. And before the CBPP3, it was 30 to 35 percent. I think there is two ways to explain, probably. One is the ECB involvement, which is a strong support, and the tightening also. And obviously, the tightening, I remember that in uh, 2013 and 2014, we have seen some Korean investor, Chinese, and so on, uh, with lead orders. It's no more the case for uh, for Kafil. Huh? I don't know for all the issues, but I think it's too tight now to to attract the demand from Asia, for, from Asia, for example. And when you go on your next non-European roadshow, are you talking about the directive and saying this is improving things? Yeah, it's improving, obviously. Yeah, it's, it's improving. Part, of the, part things. of the pitch book. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Okay, can we go back to that survey, and can I actually ask panelists to vote as well? So, what do, what do you, do you, first of all, do you believe there will be global growth in the market? Mm. And do you agree with our audience, Ad? So, what is the most important drive? Uh, the current bond directive doesn't get a very good vote there. <laughs> mm. uh, somebody uh, voted. Uh, <laughs> I think the main driver is probably like uh, many things in life, um, uh, uh, many things are relative. If these bonds uh, get more attractive, there will be more people uh, interested to, to, to buy them. And, uh, well, clearly now with, um, well, events like this and with the directive, uh, th there's more, um, uh, more publicity and uh, increasing interest uh, also outside of Europe for the uh, covered bond product. In the end, I think uh, also an important driver will be that it remains a solid product where I'm people, sorry, that, that it remains a solid product in which people have trust yeah. and... Uh, that, that's not on there. No, so you're, uh, that's why I'm telling you, uh, basically your answers uh, are incorrect. <laughs> <laughs> that's one vote for option E. Yeah, so... <laughs> I think what is important is that it remains a solid product where people can have trust in. I think things like the directive and, um, and uh, Basel can help there, of course. Um, and at the same time, it should uh, be a product that for investors is uh, attractively also priced 
that they are willing to put some money into it. Okay. Frank, you're not allowed to give the same answer. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I'm fine. Uh, I will go for the, uh, what, for the global growth. First, because there's only mega 6%, so we have to prop up that a bit. And uh, second, because I interpret in what give it a certain interpretation, it's uh, not about uh, growth being half a percentage uh, higher or lower globally. And it is whether or not uh, we'll have uh, uh, a new uh, yeah, sort of financial crisis or some financial distress. Because as we heard in the panel before, uh, before lunch, um, issuing, uh, issuing volume of covered bonds fluctuates uh, over time. And this is very much a function uh, of um, the refinancing situation of issuers. If things are fine, as recently, um, or as now, um, then issuer will go for senior unsecured for most of the time and uh, will not use uh, covered bond very much. So current issuance in covered bonds is uh, shrinking or at least stable at a low level. And that's for a good reason that the issuer uh, do so. Because if things turn sour, and then they have collateral at hand, they have a, a refinancing instrument at hand, which is covered bond, that they can use to replace uh, uh, senior unsecured issuance in order uh, to get to the same issue and volume overall that they use. And so uh, that's what I mean by uh, going for global growth. Sammy? You're not allowed to say the same as either Frank or No, no. <laughs> I, I, I really strongly believe that it's the needs which are the driver. Yeah. Uh, and uh, for example, in our case, uh, uh, we, uh, we, have, uh, we have been given a second mission, which is to refinance the largest port loan. Why? Because it was a need for the country. Uh, to, to have a scheme uh, such as the German one or in other countries, the Swedish one, and to have a strong refinancing platform to help the French exporters. I, I think at the end of the day, if you, you, you think that it's regulatory, which is, uh, uh, which is uh, really uh, uh, support, uh, it's not at all a support. We are financing needs. The bond market has been designed to finance long-term needs. That's the, the, the strong idea. And uh, just uh, to, to finish on one point, uh, it's very, it was very interesting when we got the second mission to refinance the large export uh, contracts. Uh, we had discussion with uh, rating agencies, with banks, with many people, and uh, all uh, say the market participants say, okay, be careful, don't put your export loan in the cover pool. And the question I had, why? Because I have the uh, unconditional, irrevocable, and the first demand guarantee from the French Republic. It's fine. No, 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 but you know, it's a cover pool. Uh, uh, it's, uh, it's not good to put the export loan. And what we have decided to, 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 to do is that SFIL is financing, is uh, taking on its balance sheet the export loan, and SFIL, as a state-owned bank, is refinanced by the covered bond vehicle, CAFI. It's incredible to, uh, to build such a uh, complicated uh, uh, way to finance the export. The most uh, straightforward and simple was to put everything in the cover pool. But sorry, be, be careful, don't frighten the investors. I'm not sure that the investors will be uh, frightened by that. I think that it's only that the consensus and the people in the covered bond market in Europe mm -hmm. are thinking that we need to have all mortgages or public sector exposure. Okay, it's fine, but at the end of the day, the underlying risk when you have the unconditional guarantee of the sovereign is really the same than a direct exposure on the public sector. That has nothing different, and I think that we have to be less, uh, I would say, uh, conservative and totally in the view of the last century on the product. I'm not afraid of export loans in your cover pool. Sorry? I'm not afraid of export guaranteed loans in your cover pool. But you are a sophisticated investor. <laughs> 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 on that harmonious note, do we, have, um, do we have any questions on any of the topics that we've covered today? Luca. I'm Luca from the ECBC. We know. Uh, I, the first question that you raised, the difference between the 5% in the directive and the 10% of Basel, for me, there are two different concepts. And, uh, we had discussion also with the legal department of the Commission on this. The first one, the covered bond directive, is a legal requirement for OSD. 
The second one is not referring clearly to a legal requirement. For me, the interpretation of that 10% is an actual full realization that has to be disclosed. So uh, the nature of the, the two things for me uh, is not correct to compare the two things because I think uh, mm -hmm. the, the first one is obviously a legal requirement. The other one, no. I think the language in page 11, it's, uh, it's clearly for me not referring to a legal requirement. So mm -hmm. this will help very much in making the cover bond directive fully compliant with Basel, apart from the ships, that is a little different story. But I mean, uh, there is, I think that it's an area where we can interpret it. I think we, people can have different view, but I mean, for me, it's not fully correct to compare the two things because we are speaking about two different uh, elements. So uh, I don't know if the, the panel uh, had the same kind of uh, reflection on that point, but for me, the buzz of paper is not speaking clearly about the legal requirement. So that was just a, mm. a comment. Well, that wasn't a question. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Do anyone have any questions? <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, in that case, sorry, Anne. Yeah. Uh, on your comment that uh, the future of the covered bond market shouldn't just be in mortgages and public sector loan, um, why should it be different? Because at the end of the day, I mean, covered bonds were born because you had the ALM matching between assets and liability. Those assets happen to be low risk, so then you had the pricing uh, difference. And then because of this, they got uh, a preferential uh, regulatory treatment. So why should, we, why should we have other assets, and why can't this asset be funded by senior and secured? Why does everything have to be uh, secured nowadays? At the time where we talk about asset encumbrance, blah, blah, blah. Who wants to answer that? We are to you. just... Uh, in some, uh, the, the, my comment was around the, uh, the fact that in some countries, and it was uh, also the, the, the comment from Richard, uh, you don't have any mortgages out there. He said the mortgage market is a small one, you do not have a direct financing of the local authorities. Even in big countries, huh? in the UK, it's the government who, which is financing the local authorities. It's not something only for emerging countries. Sorry, I'm Richard. <laughs> 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 uh, but in some countries in which I would say that the covered bond community would like to see covered bonds emerge, uh, new covered bonds uh, framework, I think the, for example, in infrastructure, you have some loans with the explicit guarantee of the government are structured in a way that the underlying credit risk is very low. It's very important that just I think it's consistent with just what you have explained. We need assets which are really matching in terms of risk, like, uh, maturities, the covered bond product on the liability side. But in some countries, it is we can find such assets. I, uh, it's, I'm not a specialist, or, or it's what I've heard from good specialists from very good banks uh, that uh, you can find such assets. We've uh, gone hopelessly over our time. Thank you very much for your attention. I think we've all deserved a coffee. And please join me in thanking my panelists. Thank you. Thank you.